morning Indonesia and Malaysia. And good afternoon, New Zealand. We are delighted to welcome you to the international webinar entitled Economic and Business Recovery in Asia after COVID-19 pandemic. We welcome the distinguished presenters and all the participants. I am Christina and this is my partner, Vivian Edin. We are very glad to see you here. Before we begin the webinar, let us pray. Allow me to lead the prayer in Christian. The other, please kindly support us. Father, we come to you this hour asking for your blessing and help us we are gathered together. We pray for guidance in the matters at hand and ask that you will clearly show us how to conduct our work program with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Thank you for the prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, now let us sing the national anthem of Indonesia, followed by the and University anthem.
Ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Business, Mr. Dr. Perminas Pangeran, SEMSI, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Perminas Pangeran, please. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning to everyone. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the international webinar this morning. November 28, 22. First of all, I would like to express my first, my thank and appreciation to the distinguished speaker for sharing the knowledge and experiences related to the theme of economic and business recovery in Asia after COVID-19 pandemic. It is an honor for us, you can be with us. Honorable Prof. Dr. Chin Mui Yin from Tara UC. It is an honor for us, you can be with us. Honorable Pandit Chiptono PhD from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. It is an honor for us that you are willing to be a speaker. Dear Pristanto Silalahi, SAMSA, Faculty of Business, Tutawacana Christian University, thank you for your willing to be a speaker. Allow me also to thank Purnawan Ardianto, MSc Development, Faculty of Business, Tutawacana Christian University, as the moderator. I would like also to convey my sincere appreciation to the student executive board of the Faculty of Business, the Tawachana Christian University, Yogyakarta, for organizing this important event, the first international conference, by addressing the theme of economic and business recovery in Asia after COVID-19 pandemic. The theme and topic of each season of the conference are very stable and relevant to the current condition and the future challenge to the business strategy. How business can survive and be resilient in time of crisis. According to research conducted by small and medium enterprise office of the special region of Yogyakarta, 2021, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has significantly disrupted several micro, small, and medium enterprise in Yogyakarta. Some of them have recovered and others are still in trouble and even bankrupt. Ladies and gentlemen, this event, this event is one of the real season of MOE between Faculty of Business Dutawacana Christian University and Tari UC. Apart from this event, we are also committed to supporting collaboration in the field of teaching, research, and community service at the international level. In this case, I express my gratitude to the president of TAR UC. Professor Lee Siwei. We also hope this kind of collaboration can be extended to others' university. Finally, we allow me to extend my appreciation to all participants participant of this event. I wish you an extremely fruitful conference, and this seminar can contribute new insight for you. Thank you very much. God bless us. Thank you, Mr. Minas Pangeran. Now we would listen to Yuanda Prasetyo as the coordinator of this webinar. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom. Om swastiastu. Now, Udaya, greetings to all of us. Thank you to each one of you for being 
here today at this Zoom meeting. Today, we are very pleased and honored to have you all with us. First of all, let us say praise to God who give forward to us until this day. And we had the occasion to can implement today's webinar in a good condition. Before I say something in the in this greeting, the previous I thank Sir Insinyur Henry Ferriadi, MSc, BSG, as a rector of Duta Wacana Christian University. Then, thanks Sir Dr. Verminas Pangeran, MSc, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Business at Duta Wacana Christian University. Welcome and thank you for coming to the, this webinar, Mam Chinmuin Hin PhD from Tunku Abdul Rahman University of Management and Technology, Malaysia. Sir Fandi Jiptono, PhD from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And Sir Pristanto Silalai, SE, MSE from Dutawacana Christian University. Who, who, be, who will be our today's speaker? And thank you to our moderator, Sir Dr. Andus Purnawan Hardianto, MEC Dev from Dutawacana Christian University. The last thank you to all the lecturers who came to the with this webinar. I would like to express my appreciation to the committee who generously have to help, help us make this international webinar come true. In today's international webinar, we would learn about economy and business recovery in Asia after COVID-19. I am the chief executive of this webinar hope that all of the participants can learn from today's speaker. That is all for me. Sorry if there is a, there is a, a wrong word accidentally in this webinar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, on swastiastu, now budaya, greetings to all of us. Thank you for all the remarks. Now, this is the time to start the event. We will be continuing the time to remind all of you in the Zoom meeting to turn on your camera and keep your microphone muted. And to rename your name with the format that has been provided. Without further ado, we would love to introduce our moderator, Mr. Dr. Andes Purnawan Hardianto. And this is the graduate from the Australian University. He was also a member of Indonesia Management Forum and a lecturer for 20 years in the Kawasana Christian University. Now on, Mr. Purnawan will guide you to the discussion later. Mr. Purnawan, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, as mentioned by the Master of Ceremony, my name is Purnawan Hardianton, the moderator of this uh, webinar. It is glad we can meet online in this webinar that will discuss very hot topics about business and economic recovery in Asia after COVID-19 pandemics. As all you know, we have severe crisis for almost three years since early of 2020 until now due to COVID-19 pandemic. The global economy was slowing down. After COVID-19 pandemic faded away, now the political and economic turmoil was began after Russia invasion in Ukraine. The war has been followed by the economic sanction from both sides that net world economy is in a very difficult situation. Slowing economic growth, high inflation, food and energy crisis now faced by the global economy. Some in international institutions, such as International Monetary Fund and World Bank, predicted that world economy will be getting worse and worse in the next future. That is why I said, as I said before, our webinar topic today will be a very important for all of us. 
In our webinar today, we have three speakers. All of them, and all of them are academician, researchers, and analysts from the different country and different field. They will present their views from different perspective according to their academic background and environment. First speaker is Ms. Chin Muyin, PhD. She is an associate professor of Department of Economics, Corporate Administration, Tuku Umar, Tuku Abdul Rahman, University of Malaysia. And the second speaker is Mr. Fandi Ciptono, PhD. He is an as, also an associate professor at the School of Marketing and International Business, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. He is also an adjunct professor at Department of Family and Consumer Business, Faculty of Human Ecology, Bogor Institute of Agriculture, or known as Institut Pertanian Bogor Indonesia. Second speaker, uh, sorry, the third speaker is Mr. Pre Stanto Silalai, Master of Science and Economics. He is an economist of mon in monetary and international economics. At Faculty of Business, Tawajana Christian University of Indonesia. He is also a researcher at the Demographic Institution, Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia, Jakarta. Each speaker will present their point of views to the webinar topic in maximum 30 minutes. Firstly, I invite Ms. Chin Muyin of Tunku Abdurrahman University, Malaysia, to present their point of view. Before that, I will read her curriculum vitae, short curriculum vitae, because it's very long curriculum vitae that I got, about 14 pages. <laughs> but I will uh, give a, a very brief one. Ms. Chun Muyi is an associate professor at the Faculty of Accountancy finance and business, and the head of Center for Postgraduate Study and Research at Tunku Abdurrahman, Malaysia. She obtained her PhD from University of Malaya, Malaysia in 2013. Her research interest in international economics, financial economics, and small medium enterprises. Her area expertise are international trades, foreign direct investment, applied microeconomics, belt and road initiative, issues of small medium enterprises, free trade zone. I think uh, that's all that I can uh, present to about the curriculum vitae of Ms. Chin Muyin. Now, Ms. Chin Muyin, time is yours. 30 minutes maximum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Punawan, for your introduction. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. All right. I'm glad that I can be here to share my research findings. Uh, although today is a declare a holiday of Malaysia by our new prime minister. All right. So uh, I hope that you can uh, enjoy the sharing. Okay. So let's allow me to share my screen. Uh, I'm not able to share because of uh, host disabled the participant screen sharing. So is it okay for you to help me to actually uh, enable me to share the screen? Sorry, the committee, could you please uh, make uh, the uh, Ms. Uh, Chuan Min, uh, Mr. Muyin Chin as a co-host, sorry, the admin? Okay, so already I think this is... It, you already uh, has cause. Okay, all right. Okay, I would like to continue. Yes. Okay, okay, I can make it. Can everyone see it? Yes. All right, that's great. Go on. Okay. All right. So again, good morning to ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad that uh, this morning I can share with you my research findings. So I'm Muyin from Dugu Abdurrahman University of Management and Technology. 
And we just upgraded to a full fresh university. And before that, our name is called Tunku Abdul Rahman uh, University College. All right. So the topic that I would like to share with you all today is the impact of COVID-19 on the trade performance in Europe and Central Asian region. All right. Why we choose Europe and Central Asian region? Because we are within this region. And then, in fact, there are seven regions based on the criteria set by the World Bank. So I choose this uh, region in my research findings. All right. So for this sharing, it is divided into a few sessions, including the introduction, the brief literature review, the methodology, the discussion of the result, as well as the policy implication. I would like to start with the introduction. All right. So first of all, okay, a little bit of background of the COVID-19 is that it has been discovered the COVID-19 in the late December 2019. All right. And World Health Organization, which in short is called WHO, has declared the COVID-19 outbreak as a global pandemic. All right, as a global pandemic on the 11th March 2020 because of the rapid spread and also the seriousness of this disease. And even though now COVID-19 is called as a uh, endemic by most of the countries, but it still remains serious because of the emergence of new variants. Even though the uh, economy is open, but because of when the people are infected COVID-19, they still have to go for quarantine. So it still poses a lot of challenges to the economy, not only in, uh, in Malaysia, Indonesia, but in the whole world. All right. And based on the World Health Organization report, as of 10 days ago, which is 18 November 2022, all right, this pandemic had impacted the countries worldwide. Actually, more than 600 million of people all right, infected COVID-19 cases, and out of which more than 6 million of people died because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this report also revealed that among all the countries, United States topped the list with more than 90 million cumulative confirmed causes, a confirmed cases, and then more than 1 million cumulative cases of death. All right, so it is really a very horrible pandemic, all right, for the entire world. All right. And this pandemic has caused significant disruption to the international economic activities. It has gravely wounded the world economy, resulting in the shrinking private consumption. When the private consumption reduces, it will indirectly reduce the external demand and affect the international trade. Besides that, because of the closure of the production from time to time due to the COVID-19, the supply disruption has already felt in the community sectors and also it has contributed to a slower growth. And this supply disruptions is still unsolved until today. And it's now become a global supply disruptions. Every country in the world feel the pain of it. And the full impact of the pandemic is likely to remain unclear, even though we call it as an endemic by most of the countries, because in order to be clear, we need to wait un until the health risk has eased entirely. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. All right, in fact, the pandemic has triggered the large price movement in some sectors in particularly food, transportation, clothing, and communication. All right. And due to the uh, pandemic has transited to the endemic period, the initial economy recovery stage starts to be happened in some advanced countries and the emerging markets. When it's happened, the demand will increase. But when demand increases at the same time, supply disruption is still unsolved is still a rapid acceleration in the inflation since 2021. Supply shortage, rapidly rising commodity price. These are the two factors or the main contributors to the escalation of prices or what we call global inflation. And this has adversely or negatively impacted the trade performance not only in Malaysia, Indonesia, New Zealand, 
but in a whole room. Let's look at the statistic from the World Trade Organization. This is a World Trade volume from 2016 to 2020. From this statistic, we can see that the merchandise export volume has increased daily from 2016 to 2018. Even though 2019, all right, the pandemic has just discovered in the December, but you can see that it's a slight decline in the trade volume. And then in the year 2020, it's declined significantly. However, even though there is evidence that the trade deterioration has occurred from the year 2019, this study is timing to examine whether this trade deterioration is really impacted by COVID-19. All right, we need to have the regression to confirm whether it is really impacted by COVID-19 or it is caused by other factors. All right. And due to the existence of the COVID-19 pandemic, achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals will become challenging. We have a total of 17 SDGs, and one of the SDGs, which is SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, will become very difficult to achieve due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Decent Work and Economic Growth. However, trade is important. International trade is very important for everyone in the world because it is essential to save lives and also the livelihood. Therefore, there is the need to keep the trade going, flowing, to ensure a sufficient supply of essential goods for all the people in the world. And luckily, most countries in the world today have become more integrated and impose trade openness policies because now most of the country believe that the impact of COVID-19 on one country will affect its trading partners. Let's look at the positive way. When there is an additional demand for pharmaceutical products such as a face mask, medicine, vaccine, and also detergent, we brought about a positive spike in the exports from the countries of origin. Therefore, we know that. In the past, we know, but now we can ascertain that it is so important about the global network of production and consumption. So most countries in the world now become more and more co-integrated. All right. Now, what is the objective of these studies after we talk about all this introduction or the background? So this study is actually divided into two. Number one, we would like to investigate how COVID-19 pandemic has affected the trade performance in the countries that we stay, which is Europe and Central Asian region. And secondly, we would like to examine if there have been significant changes in the impact of trade determinants. All right, besides the COVID, all right, they have the usual trade determinants such as the GDP, infrastructure, landlord countries, and so on. We would like to know whether these trade determinants change the impact before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are the objectives of this study. And what is the contributions of this study? Or do we call it the significance of studies? We are also having two significance of study here. Number one, we provide a better understanding of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the international trade performance. And also, we could provide the insights for the region, for the governments of the countries under this region to formulate, to share, and to implement effective policy in order to enhance the trade performance of this region. All right, so this is uh, our first part, which is the introduction. Because of the time constraint, I would like to give a very brief literature review all right, on the determinants of international trade. Okay, we pick one which is the most important or relevant okay, a study that relevant to our topic, which is from Hayakawa and Mukunukis. All right, so this paper is published in 2021 and they examine how COVID-19 affect the international trade. And the researchers 
has uh, used COVID-19 variable and also the uh, death cases as their variable. All right. And then based on their study, their conclusion is divided into two. Number one, they verify that COVID-19 negatively and significantly affected the exporting and importing countries' international trade. Second, from July 2020 onwards, the effects of COVID-19, particularly for the importing countries, become lesser, tended to fade. Why? Because of vaccination and the COVID-19 pandemic is going to the end and then we are in the transition to endemic. All right. Yeah. Despite the pandemic negatively affected the movement of goods and services, according to the author, the same economists were not immune to the usual factors that affect the trade. What are the usual factors? The usual factors, as what I showed just now, is the GDP, which uh, pro proxy the economic growth of the countries, all right, the infrastructure, all right, whether the country is a landlock country, whether you are a member of WTO, which is the World Trade Organization, and also other frictions of international business. These are all the usual factors of trade, okay, that help to determine whether the country has the ability and the capabilities to engage or participate in the global economy. And these are some of the papers that when you are available, please feel free to read it. All right. And now we would like to move on to the methodology. What we use to do this study. First of all, as I mentioned, infrastructure is a usual determinant of trade. So we would like to know whether infrastructure index play a role, okay? in affecting international trade performance during the pandemic, all right, and compared to before the pandemic. So in order to compute the infrastructure index, we need to employ principal component analysis, which we call PCA, all right, by using this equation. And we are actually adopted three the very important indicators for infrastructure to compute the composite infrastructure index, namely, the fixed telephone subscriptions, second, the air transport, and third, the percentage of the population with access to electricity. So we use the PCA to compute the composite infrastructure index in order to be one of the variables of our model. And then we have to uh, form our baseline model. Okay, so the baseline model as follows is formed in order to examine whether COVID-19 have the impact on trade performance. So you can see the trade here. Trade here, okay, before I continue to explain each and every of these uh, variables, okay, as our focus is on cent uh, Europe and Central Asian region, so we actually adopted 44 countries data. Why only 44 countries? It is, this is due to the data limitation. So we adopted 44 Okay, countries of Europe and Central Asian regions data in order to compute this uh, uh, baseline model and run the regression. So the trade here refer to the exports come the import of goods and services of each country using the constant price, which is constant 2015 US dollar. And COVID here refer to the total COVID cases in each country. COVID death here refer to the total death cases due to COVID in each country. The GDP here refer to the GDP per capita in each country using the constant price of 2015 US dollar. And GDP uh, underscore W here refer to the difference of the world GDP and the GDP of each country. Infra here refer to the infrastructure index that we compute for each country. The GOV here refer to the regulatory quality of each country. Land here is the dummy variable. One refer to the country is a landlocked country, whereas zero refer to the not a landlocked country. And WTO here is also a dummy variable, whereby zero represent this is not a WTO member, whereas one represent this is a WTO membership. So we would like to see all these factors 
whether all these factors affecting international trade performance in Europe and Central Asian region before and after COVID-19 pandemic. So before COVID-19 pandemic, we will run one regression, which is in the year of 2018. And after COVID-19 pandemic, all right, when it is in the peak, it was be in the year 2020. So we, want, we run one regression in 2018, another regression in 2020. And now we would like to see the result. So first of all, we look at the PCA analysis. Okay, from the PCA analysis, we found that the first factor has the highest of the eigen values, which means it represents most of the variance of all countries. How many percent? 57.34. So we use the first factor to compute our infrastructure index. And after the infrastructure index is computed, then we use it to run the regression. And now we see the result. All right, so here is the result. So from the result, okay, we can see that COVID cases do have a negative impact on international trade performance on Europe and Central Asian region, but it is insignificant. That means it's actually cannot be counted because it is insignificant. And it is interestingly, the death cases of COVID-19 has a positive a positive impact on trade performance, and it is significant. Why it is so? Why this happen? All right. So based on our analysis, this situation might be cause of the severity or the seriousness of the COVID nineteen causes the government to escalate the speed to purchase the COVID nineteen related products such as medicine, vaccine face masks and so on and therefore it stimulate the economy uh, sorry it stimulate the international trade and this argument was aligned with one of the past paper in 2020 and the authors argue that european union have waived the custom unions as well as the value added tax on medical as well as the protective equipment imports from the non-European Union country since the date of January 2020. How about the usual trade determinants? For example, GDP per capita, differences of GDP, infrastructure, we can see that they are having similar impact on international trade before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. GDP and the differences of the GDP still remain the most important determinants of international trade performance, regardless whether we are actually endure the COVID-19 pandemic or not. All right. Therefore, we can conclude that the trade performance is still very much depending on whether the country has the ability and the capacity to engage in international trade. And one more interesting finding from this study is that the regulatory quality before COVID-19 pandemic, you can see that although it has a positive impact on the international trade performance, but it is insignificant. But after COVID-19 pandemic happened, you can see that all right, the role of the regulatory uh, quality become more important. Okay, The coefficient increase and it's also become significant. That means it implies that after COVID-19 pandemic happened, people are more focusing on the regulatory quality and more focusing on its importance in order to lead the people out from the pandemic, all right, by the government. All right, so these are the implications that we can find from the result. And now we move on to the last session of today's sharing which is the policy implication. All right, we are facing the supply disruption. And in order to solve the problem of supply disruption, most of the country impose export restriction. However, ex so export restriction. However, the export restrictions is just a temporary solution. So what would be the permanent solution? The permanent solution is that the country have to find way to increase the production capacity. Because when you increase the production capacity, 
you can solve the supply problem by having more output and that is can spur the economic growth through international trade. And because of the COVID-19 already transit into the pandemic period, a lot of country has reopened the economy, borders are open, business are started to recover. However, they face abundant challenges, including supply disruption, rising costs, instability, labor shortage, and so on. So it is very difficult and challenging for the businesses to go back to the pre-crisis levels, okay? As such, we might need government intervention. And the businesses are also urged to move towards digitalization in order to expand their market share beyond the country borders with the minimum cost. But we understand that it is not all the businesses sectors are suitable for digitalization. And luckily, currently, various policy have been aggressively implemented by different governments depending on each country's situation. And all these efforts have aimed to minimize the impact of COVID-19 and return the economies to the pre-crisis levels. Despite all these challenges, because of the countries not aware of the importance of trade openness and become more integrated, we believe that when all the countries work together hand in hand, all right, we believe that the economy can overcome all these challenges and return to the pre-crisis levels or beyond in the near future. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I hope I did not exceed the 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Over back to you, Dr. Purnawan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Moi It's It was very uh, uh, impressive uh, presentation. Uh, it's very brief and uh, very clear about the situation during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially in uh, the impact in Europe and uh, in East Asia. Okay, uh, I will recall some points that uh, is already mentioned by uh, Professor Mui Yin Chin in uh, her presentation. Number of dead by uh, COVID-19 has affected significantly on international trade. Yeah? Yes. And then secondly, regularity of country policies um, more give impacts during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. And the third one, export restriction as a, must be as a temporary solution. The, the permanent solution must be increase the production capacity of the country. Yeah. And reopening of the economy and digitalization must be uh, impl uh, implied by the government is very soon. And I think uh, uh, the international cooperation, and the last one, is the most important issues to overcome uh, from the crisis. I think uh, this, uh, this uh, five points that I can recall from your presentation. Thank you very much from uh, Prof. Mui Yin Chin. It's very excellent. Thank you. And uh, the next uh, speaker uh, from the, sorry, I will read his CV. Uh, from Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, Mr. Fandi Chiptono, PhD. I will uh, read the, uh, his short, brief, uh, very brief uh, curriculum vitae. Mr. Fandi Chiptono, PhD, is an associate professor of the School of Marketing and International Business at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. He is also a young professor at the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences, Faculty of Human Ecology, Bogor Institute of Agriculture, or known as uh, Institute Pertanian Bogor at Indonesia. Before joining uh, Victoria University of Wellington, he worked at Monas University Malaysia <laughs> and University at Majaya Yogyakarta. He has more than 25 years of marketing teaching experience at both undergrad and graduate levels at several university in Indonesia, Australia, Malaysia, and New Zealand. 
His main research interest is in consumer behavior, marketing practices, and business strategy in emerging market. The specific areas include brand longevity and brand management, consumer ethnics and religiousness, corporate and consumer social responsibility, and sustainable consumption. I think that's all. It's a very long curriculum video. I just give a, a highlight of the first curriculum video. Uh, Mr. Fandi Ciptono, time is yours, uh, 30 minutes maximum. Thank you. Thank you. So let me try to share my screen. Oh, can, can I share my screen? Because it needs to be stopped sharing yes. first. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. You already are co host now. Okay, thanks. Let me move this somewhere. Can you hear me, everyone, clearly? Yes, clear. Okay. Now, kia uh, ora. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's my privilege to be part of this wonderful international webinar. So as being introduced by the moderator, my name is Fandi. My topic is about resilience and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic insights from the hotel industry. I will share some of the findings from my research with my colleagues, the, uh, the, the studies that we have done, especially the one within the hotel industry in Indonesia and Malaysia. So my agenda, I will start with brief introduction, and then I will talk about business longevity in general, and then some of the key findings, resilience and recovery from COVID-19 from hotel industry, because hotel is one of the largest sectors within tourism and hospitality industry. And then some concluding remarks and hopefully in Q&A, we can have more discussion about the key aspects that I have presented. So uh, moderator also already uh, introduce me in my CV, my background a little bit. My undergrad is in management, specializing in marketing. My master's is in marketing, my PhD in marketing. What a boring <laughs> academic background, right? I wish I could do you know, like nuclear science or you know, like being an engineering, but unfortunately, that is not the story of my life. So I'm very into marketing part. Okay, by this time, I believe that everyone has become an expert of COVID-19, right? Everyone can talk about COVID-19. So I don't want to go into detail. I just give a brief background about COVID-19. Now, a couple of days ago, I checked on the number of cases. You can see globally 636 million cases. And when you look at the history, COVID-19 is not the first global pandemic, actually. We can look at the stories of Spanish flu and other kinds of diseases. However, the crisis caused by COVID-19 is one of the worst and predicted to have long-term negative global effects. Just for another you know, like comparison, if you look at the total number of cases in Indonesia, couple of days ago, it stood at 6.6 .6 million cases. And then daily cases still, we have significant number, but it seems like everywhere, people perceive that COVID-19 is no longer there. While in fact, if we need to, we, we need to monitor the effects to some degree to stay healthy. And hopefully this will not have longer effect. Now, when we talk about the effects on businesses, many people said that, don't worry guys, everybody, we are you know, like in the same boat. In fact, I would like to refer to this nice quote by Damien Barr saying that we are in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. Because you're like the effects are not equally the same for everyone. 
I can show you examples. Early in 2020, some people conducted studies, a cons consulting firm in Egypt, for instance, showed that the effects of COVID-19 on businesses, okay, have been considered you know, like different for different cases or different industries. I saw someone raise the hand. I think you know, like there will be a Q&A session, right? So Natasha Kai, for instance, okay. So now if we look at this data, it says that tourism and leisure sector is one of the worst hit by COVID-19. Aviation all on the left-hand side with a red color, right? While on the right-hand side, you can see medical supply and services, food processing and retail, personal and healthcare and others within green, they are predicted and we have seen the evidence they have positive impact or not that severe. In the middle, however, our business education is in between. If we can handle it, that will be okay. If not, we will be in trouble, right? So now I would like to focus on one of the sectors being predicted and reported as the worst hit by the pandemic. Now we see earlier I mentioned that very difficult to predict the long-term implications and there have been there has been lack of specific studies on the long-term implications of a pandemic, especially on business. However, when we saw that you know, like a cartoon or picture showing that the effects are different, we know that in general, all the reports in business magazines or news, we learn that COVID-19 pandemic outbreak has caused many businesses to close their doors, right? Went bankrupt. However, not everyone. We can see some businesses are actually experiencing unprecedented growth. For instance, the platform that we are using now, Zoom, has grown rapidly because of the pandemic, right? Now, some businesses like food delivery, online communication, solutions for remote work, cleaning products, and healthcare-related products, they are actually growing. Now, a little bit background on why we, are in, we were interested in this topic. When you talk about major crisis, there have been many studies about that focusing on issues, for instance, survival. Why survival matters, especially when we talk about business? At least I can provide you with two broad arguments. The first one, survival is a basic goal for any kind of organizations, profit and non-profit. And another issue, another argument is, it is a precondition for success, for success in other performance measures. How can you grow if you do not survive? That's why survival, especially long-term survival, is a major concern. Now, in my previous study, I'm so into brand longevity or brand long-term survival. I did many lead reviews into different fields related to this topic. And then you can see within economics discipline, accounting and financial management, population ecology or organizational theory, PLC, popular in marketing, human capital theory, strategic management, technology management, integrated perspectives. All of these perspectives, they try to understand what factors can explain long-term survival or what we call longevity. Now, however, when we talk about survival within a major crisis like with, uh, during pandemic, these literatures, they do not provide insightful you know, uh, explanations about what we need and how some companies can survive and grow during difficult times. And that is one of our motivations to conduct this study. Now, when you talk about longevity, start up when you start the business, struggle for the first couple years, then it could be survive, 
could be supremacy if you dominate, dominate the market or sayonara. This is what, what business owners do not want to be in, right? Now, another thing that I would like to highlight is the importance of what we call business resilience. Theoretically, when you talk about resilience, we have three interrelated factors here. Vulnerability, adaptive capacity, and resilience itself, which will be shown by diversity of methods or ways of doing things, efficiency, flexibility, and cohesion. Our study will show you how these interrelated factors are important in building the resilient uh, capability of businesses. Now let's move to the topic of hotel industry. We chose hotel industry, as I said earlier, because hotel industry is the, one of the largest sectors within tourism and hospitality. And then we focus on Malaysia and Indonesia. We rely on published materials. I will talk about methodology uh, like in the next couple of slides. Now, tourism sector is very vulnerable to any issues related to safety and security and health issues. Lessons in, from the past like volcanic eruptions, terrorism, tsunamis, earthquakes, all of these catast catastrophic events have had negative effects on tourism. Now, COVID-19 also has changed tourism activities globally everywhere. We know about quarantine, travel ban, anything all about restrictions leading to tra travel cancellations and lost mm -hmm. revenues. Now, these photos show what happened in Bali, for instance, before COVID, this was the airport. During COVID, during the lockdown, especially almost none, uh, tourists visited uh, the island. Now, one of the data that I can provide you, for instance, from the latest study from Statista, it shows that employment lost in travel and tourism industry in 2021, I highlighted Indonesia. So how to read this table? In 2021, 1.43 million less workers in tourism and travel industry compared to 2019. So within two years, we lost around 1.4 workers. They went unemployed. So one of the, the data to show the negative impact on the industry. Now, this lead, leads us to the question, how does the hotel industry in Indonesia and Malaysia adjust or adapt their business strategies to survive and hopefully to grow during the pandemic? To answer that question, we decided because the, the, the study, if we want to conduct a large scale study using interviews, for instance, or surveys during the COVID-19, it was almost impossible. So we decided to do a simple method, which is historical method. We rely on publicly available and accessible data from newspapers printed and online, both versions in Bahasa Indonesia for Indonesian uh, contacts and also English in both countries. So we collected news online and also the printed versions in two countries anything related to tourism, hotels in particular, COVID-19, coronavirus, recovery, growth, survival, using the combination, using Boolean logic combinations of these keywords. So the list of the newspapers, for instance, in Indonesia, we refer to Compass, Business Indonesia, Media Indonesia, Investor Daily, Jakarta Post, The Tick, and Kontan. While in Malaysia, we refer to The Star, Brita Harian, New Straight Times, etc. So we did this together. I conducted this study with my two colleagues, co colleagues from Mones University, Malaysia. Now, what we found, 
these hotels in the reports that we conducted we did a thematic systematic thematic uh, analysis content analysis we categorized the strategies into four types cost based strategies product based strategies market based strategies and community based strategies we look into the reports anything to do with cost cutting price adjustments downsizing we group them under cost based strategies how to focus on efficiency product based strategies and others we will have a look at these these strategies one by one so for instance the first one the first one is the cost based strategy okay the key focus is on efficiency it is expected when a firm or a company is in a difficult situation first thing that came to them the that it comes to the minds of the owners and management is to cut costs right we can expect this everyone did that during covid-19 so how to find ways to improve efficiency so under this category we have different specific strategies the first one is cost cutting strategies started from something like saving the electricity the reports in the news reducing the use of lifts aircons laundry machines and video tron services some hotels reported that they replaced breakfast breakfast buffets with room service breakfast to save money others they shifted you know, like the, the working hours offering unpaid leaves reduce the salaries and and so on and so on so they found they tried to find ways to save or to control the expenditures second strategy within cost based strategies include price adjustments so some reports for instance a hotel in penang sold some food from the hotel's restaurants on the food path at a price of 3 ringgit only we saw the pictures the photos and also viral on social media also in some other hotels usually you know, like the hotels restaurants they are exclusive right but during this difficult time many hotels they tried their best to maintain the business keep the business afloat providing discounts cashback coupons vouchers you can see one example here they reduced the prices significantly during covid-19 or a popular policy implemented by many hotels during this time book now stay later promotion the third strategy is what we call downsizing cut down the working hours administering pay cuts and they reduced the temporary uh, employees closed some branches or they they decided to sell some or all of their assets so all of these strategies are expected under cost based strategies however we also observed another type of strategy product or service based strategies when we saw that some hotels they decided to repackage the current products or services they extended the services core competence into something else to try to get revenues or they move to online service delivery for especially the restaurant services so products or service repackaging for instance compliance to covid-19 protocol reduce the number of people in a meeting room for instance offering hotels as self isolation very popular during uh, the uh, early days of covid-19 pandemic bundling strategies also popular Co collaboration with airlines for instance extending current core competence and resources this is very interesting if you look at some examples here okay in malaysia for instance hotels offered home cleaning services or grass cutting services to the customers 
never before or limited services offered before, right? But they try to utilize or extend it. They, they try to extend the services. In Indonesia, home delivery, I think many of us still remember drive-through graduation services, drive-through wedding, okay? Digitalization, contactless, seamless, cashless services during COVID-19. Now, another type strategy uh, of strategies, the third one, market-based strategies, the focus is now is a bit different. Some hotels, they look for new market segments. Because of the closures of international airports and virtually no foreigners visited the countries during early days of COVID-19 pandemic, during lockdowns especially, they shifted the target market from international tourists to domestic travelers. And then, you know, that staycation, honeymoon packages, and also they started to target new segments. So for instance, they targeted university students and office workers who prefer to stay in a hotel near the campuses, near the offices to get better facilities, for instance, Wi-Fi, and also health, you know, like uh, health uh, related services. And also work from hotel was popular in both countries, Malaysia and Indonesia. And one of the hotel, uh, one of the innovation also, restaurants plus hotels, they work together camping on the beach in Bali. Now, what we found interesting outside the three strategies, cost, product or service, and uh, the market-based strategies, we found that during the hard or difficult times, we know that Asian countries are collectivistic in nature. Many hotels shown or demonstrated altruistic behavior in the form of CSR initiatives. They provided free and cheap accommodation for medical staff who were stationed in COVID-19 centers. They showed the care to the society and some of them, they invited the public to engage in their initiatives to provide helps to those work at the front lines to fight or to mitigate COVID-19. So this is interesting where you say, when we, we People can say that during difficult times, businesses, especially in this context, hotels, they have demonstrated altruistic behavior, social concerns. That's why it leads us to some important points here. Es essentially, when we talk about business strategy, it's all about way of doing uh, business and how to compete effectively. When we talk about resilience and recovery, innovation and flexibility are the two key things. We need to find ways. Sometimes people say, think outside the box. Let's say examples like how they innovated with providing services to different segments or extended their services and flexible. Now, I would like to highlight two things here. Business survival and growth. Cost-based strategies focus on survival, try to cut cost. But product and market-based strategies can help businesses not only to survive, especially when things are back to the so-called normal situation. These can be new business ideas, being entrepreneurial. And community-based strategies can build long-term relationships with key stakeholders. To summarize, all the strategies can also be formulated in a different way. I call it the four E's, efficiency, cost-based, extension, engagement, and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial strategies. So to sum up this everything, one thing that I would like to highlight, even though efficiency is one of the strategy, it is important to highlight that we can also think about innovation, flexibility, how to grow, not only 
cut cost. Otherwise, we may fall into this trap. Look at this you know, like uh, picture. I don't understand after so many budget cuts, why don't we move faster? Of course, you can't move faster. You cut all the human resources and only one people left to move forward. Thank you for having me. I pass it back to the moderator. Okay. Thank you, Professor Fandi Ciptono. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting presentation. I, I, I can recall some points uh, from your presentation. The first one, hotel and tourism industry is very vulnerable uh, that receive very big negative impact because of COVID-19 pandemic. And second, most of the industry use cost-cutting strategies price adjustment, also downsizing, and also extend the services from the industry. The most important factor that must be applied is about digitalization, innovation and flexibility, efficiency, and the last one is entrepreneurial strategies. This is very interesting. Uh, the point that you you already present. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Cheptano. And the third speaker uh, will be the host speaker, Mr. Cristanto Silalahi. I will read uh, her CV, uh, his CV, sorry. Uh, Mr. Cristanto Silalahi. Mr. Pristanto Silalahi uh, got his uh, bachelor degree from uh, Bogor Institute of Agriculture in Bogor at our Institute of Pertanian Bogor. And uh, his master is from Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia. Currently, he is the economist of the Faculty of Business, Tutawacana Christian University. And monetary and international economics. He is also the researcher at the Population Institution of University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Mr. Prisanto Silalahi, time is yours, maximum 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Pak Owen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very clear. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning for Pak Pandi Ciptono from Jakarta. Uh, from Jakarta. Good morning, Madam Moichin. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, as I mentioned uh, by moderator Pak uh, pa Wawan, uh, I introduce myself, Pristanto Silalahi, and now uh, lecturer in business faculty. Okay, I can see. I'll try to share my slide. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm very delighted uh, as a re representative of uh, Duto Wachana Christian University. Uh, so in this occasion, I would like to present and talking about uh, economic recovery in Asia and how uh, rising from this situation. Uh, for disclaimer, <laughs> uh, I'm not uh, obviously, I'm not as good as a uh, first and second speaker, but I, I will try my best. Okay. Uh, let's start from the global context. Uh, we know the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, passed the world in, into sharp uh, recession in the first uh, half of 2020. Service sector activity, which uh, relies on person-to-person -person, uh, contact, took a big hit, uh, of course. And as we know, manufacturing uh, also weak substantially and global trade uh, from, uh, plummeted. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, Madam Muichin, uh, how trade uh, impact from COVID-19. So uh, 
today uh, I will show you uh, based on uh, data and the situation. This my uh, let's hear uh, this agenda. What's happening? Okay, next one. Nah, uh, let's see. Uh, look at the the uh, line chart uh, for vertical axis is uh, described index and horizontal is uh, GDP growth, uh, especially in Asia region. You can see. Uh, Position and in Indonesia, uh, the orange color eh, is about index under uh, 100 uh, from from 20 and 19 uh, to 20 and 21. Uh, this data from the uh, global uh, survey index processing manager index uh, describe how uh, asian region index uh, describe in uh, in uh, every country in this uh, asia we can look at uh, chinese philippines indonesia thailand and malaysia and vietnam uh, Position of uh, Indonesia is uh, low, lower than Chinese, uh, than Philippines. Uh, if we compare to uh, other countries, and Indonesia and Malaysia is uh, equal. Okay. Uh, and next, uh, what's happening? Of course, uh, worsening prospect of for growth. In uh, as we know, how uh, GDP in Asia lead by China uh, up to 8.1 percent uh, in uh, April 2021 and 8.5 uh, percent in October 2021. And we can look as uh, East Asia uh, and the Chinese, Viet uh, Vietnam, Mongolia, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Indonesia. Uh, this graph illustrate to uh, to us that uh, Asia is uh, so uh, so far looking so good uh, because we we uh, gro growth economic uh, is positive. Okay, uh, and then we know. Uh, Next happening is declining employment and fewer people will escape poverty. Uh, this data uh, I calculate from the uh, World Bank. Uh, uh, we can see uh, employment to population and labor force participant. Uh, we can uh, see for orange in employment to labor force and red is labor force to population. Uh, especially Indonesia, where Indonesia is uh, Indonesia, it's a uh, negative uh, to uh, raise on negative to uh, to four and uh, low uh, the lower position is uh, my uh, Myanmar uh, uh, downside after uh, downside up to five percent. Okay. Uh, why uh, this happening? Okay. Uh, any, the first uh, is because of a re rehearsal of our term. So, uh, country condition, uh, country economic condition is uh, depends on how government capacity to provide economic stimulus uh, by expansionary fiscal and monetary fiscal access to uh, credit. Uh, and then, how government a capacity to implement a smart containment uh, strategy uh, through by uh, virus control through testing, vaccination, uh, versus uh, lockdowns and burden closure. And then uh, next uh, country, country economic condition is influenced by a uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as uh, we know, less illness and related earnings loss and health costs. Uh, and the last uh, country economic condition is depends on how strength of recovery in the rest of the world 
it's a uh, by uh, revival of trade, uh, foreign di direct investment, global financial uh, conditions. Uh, well, actually, uh, there have been many important events in global uh, world. Uh, let's back. Uh, let's flash back a little back. Uh, starting from the Great Depression, the monetary crisis, the global financial crisis, uh, and finally, uh, finally, or or the latest uh, now is uh, COVID nineteen. Of course, it's a new phase of new chapter of a new economy. So, uh, it's uh, a normal economy. Uh, and next, because of high vulnerability, vaccination is need a uh, to revive growth. Uh, of course, it is very uh, how to uh, vaccinate uh, in region Asia. We look uh, in this uh, grab bar. Uh, the first young full vaccinates uh, high. Uh, is Mongolia is a uh, very uh, very high. It's uh, after on 64 uh, 60 point, and GDP growth uh, in 21 20, uh, in 20 and 21 is uh, we can look this uh, trend is increase, but uh, uh, this is uh, how I describe uh, prospect economy is good. Uh, we can look at uh, Indonesia, uh, higher than Thailand, and but uh, lower than uh, China. And Malaysia is uh, still uh, minus than uh, Philipp uh, also Philippines. Okay, uh, why? A good export uh, record from uh, uh, service export still uh, links exp uh, except in China. Okay, in uh, I I said uh, for region I say uh, we uh, also exclude uh, China because I, uh, China is a uh, different uh, in uh, Asia region because uh, this a uh, larger economic. So uh, we can look uh, this uh, grab bar. Sorry. Okay, now. Uh, the chart illustrate how uh, Chinese lead uh, the growth uh, export uh, up uh, larger than uh, East Asia uh, Pacific, of course, and orange and the world. We know uh, in latest report from IMF, uh, they said how gloomy and uh, uncertainty uh, global uh, next future. So uh, we can see uh, in this graph that uh, China will, uh, will 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 lead the way uh, in uh, trade uh, or export. Okay, uh, and next. Okay, shortage of essential and shipping delays. Uh, this grab uh, from tw uh, 20 and 18 to 20 and 21. The this grab, uh, according to this grab, uh, increase by uh, year over year. So uh, in pie charts, we can look uh, how how big uh, Southeast Asia is. Uh, Eight percent from a uh, region uh, in the world, and government support has been declining while uh, output gap endures. So uh, we can look uh, how uh, government uh, through by fiscal uh, to support the the situation, and we can look Vietnam and Mongolia very supporting. Uh, we we spending. Uh, there's uh, allocation from the GDP. It uh, fourteen, fourteen, uh, fourteen percent, uh, uh, fourteen, uh, fourteen and fifty percent uh, from the GDP to uh, allocate to uh, declining while uh, 
apa decline to uh, vaccinate and uh, to mitigating this uh, pandemic COVID-19. And output gets we uh, we know uh, focus on 20 and 20 all uh, is country is uh, negative and we know uh, Vietnam in 2020 eh, 20 and 89 is uh, still positive uh, I think it's a uh, one percent and Philippines uh, in 20 and 29 is still positive in uh, Range on uh, zero uh, to one percent. Okay, uh, how uh, policy rates uh, to uh, respond this uh, situation and uh, pandemic COVID nineteen? Of course, uh, as I mentioned before, from the moderator in uh, how uh, global condition now, high inflation and. Uh, Of course, it's a effect to uh, policy rates from uh, every country. The first is China. Uh, we can look uh, how uh, red line in uh, China. Uh, China can uh, increase this uh, policy rates and by interest rates it, it up to four uh, percent and higher uh, than. Uh, PNG, then uh, Indonesia, then uh, Myanmar and Thailand, and uh, Malaysia too. Uh, for for policy rates, the the highest uh, to increase is uh, Myanmar uh, at seven uh, percent, and Mongolia uh, around is six uh, percent. And now we can look how uh, inflation in uh, every country, uh, China, world, and uh, East Asia Pacific uh, exclude China. Now, uh, world is position is uh, still uh, positive, uh, around uh, point four percent, and and uh, is is Asia Pacific is uh, around one percent, and uh, sorry. China is uh, uh, zero percent. Okay. Nah, uh, high inflation. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, high inflationary process have uh, from sub uh, policy rate uh, hikes in many countries. As I mentioned before, this uh, we can look in the, uh, in this picture how to England uh, increase. Uh, 2,100 basis points since uh, 2022. US increase uh, this uh, 300 basis points since uh, 2022. Uh, this is uh, stimulated uh, to other countries and bank central uh, in other countries. Uh, when when the federal reserves increase uh, federal fund rates. Uh, uh, up to 4.75 percent uh, interest rate and then effect to uh, emerging market uh, and advanced market to uh, advanced country to uh, as Europa increased 200 basis points since 2022 and we can look how Indonesia Indonesia uh, through by Bank Central Bank Indonesia uh, to increase uh, 125 basis points since uh, 2022. It's, uh, we know uh, now uh, Bank Central uh, can uh, uh, can increase basis point uh, and interest rate now uh, for uh, 0.75%. Uh, percent. And now we can look at uh, interest rate in this Tiongkok. Interest rate in Tiongkok is uh, around 6.75%. Uh, and Japan in uh, 3%. Uh, okay. Uh, how global manufacturing uh, purchasing manager index has uh, 
flip into contraction uh, John in September uh, per September 2022 we can look in uh, global global market pattern uh, fell into a contraction John from the first time since uh, June uh, 2022 we can look uh, at 50.3 index. Uh, this is uh, from uh, the, the data from the Bloomberg uh, EHS market. And ASEAN 5, we can look, uh, especially Indonesia, as, uh, looks like uh, it's a good, uh, still good. Uh, and Indonesia, uh, higher than Philippines, Vietnam, and uh, Malaysia but uh, lower compared to Thailand and Singapore. Okay, and now uh, Indonesia is led to uh, expand zone and increasing from uh, first month is 20.1%. Uh, 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 in Indonesia, US, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, and Russia. And recovery, uh, upgrade to contraction zone in previous uh, two months to expensive zone is 4.3% percent is Mexico and uh, declared uh, is expansion zone is uh, 21.7 percent is uh, from Japan, India, Vietnam, Brazil, uh, Australia and contracted in, uh, in the zone is uh, Eurozone, German, uh, Italy, Spain, UK, China, South Korea, Malaysia, Canada and Turkey. Uh, it's a uh, 47.8%. Okay, uh, the longer term policy ceilings uh, is sparing inclusive uh, growth. Of course, this century, uh, this region so either uh, increase in what of uh, inequality or uh, decline of uh, in what. For, for capita growth, we can look in uh, from the when uh, this is how uh, index uh, described to increase and China. So uh, in Indonesia, we compare to uh, China and Indonesia in uh, looking uh, good and same uh, condition. How to uh, bar, uh, red bar is uh, described to Gini ratio and uh, La, uh, chart line is uh, described to uh, GDP growth. Uh, uniquely, uh, Indonesia and China uh, same uh, condition. Okay, uh, next. For the first time, this century, uh, a potential double blow is slowing growth. Uh, we can look at how sales uh, percent is. Uh, down uh fall uh fall down up to uh 50 percent uh, negative uh sorry yes and uh effect to employment so uh we can we can see up to uh fall down up to uh 20 percent uh, in large condition okay and rising inequality across a uh, multiple dimension uh of course uh we can look uh how sector fuel security increase uh debt or sales uh, assets and interactive education uh, opportunities from key uh, quarter one uh to quarter five we can uh, look how is uh slow down and uh tend to uh decline and we can see how uh, increased debt uh, asset or sale of asset is uh, fluctuative and uh, this trend is uh, down. And uh, interactive education opportunities, uh, surprisingly, we can look from uh, uh, quarter one to quarter five is uh, uh, always increase. Okay, next. Uh, the first one is a uh, greater use to uh, wider access uh, access to digital technologies can uh, support inclusive uh, recovery of course uh, 
we know how uh, digital is uh, very important and uh, technology and in general uh, economic general theory how uh, technology progress is uh, very impactful to uh, uh, gdp growth and this uh, data how uh, supply chain management is uh, from small medium and large uh, up to uh, 60% and interactive education opportunity we can look uh, from key 1 to key 5 is uh, still increase uh, this index is percent for uh, of household is uh, up to around uh, 65 uh, percent okay and next uh, addressing to constraint to deviation of technology the first uh, in uh, left side uh, we can look perceive constraint uh, how lack of demand and uncertainty uh, uh, due to COVID-19 is uh, small, medium, and uh, large. And lack of capabilities, lack of finance, government regulation, uh, and others. Uh, the higher from a uh, perceived occasion is uh, lack of demand and uncertainty. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the last report from IMF, they... Uh, Publish how uh, gloomy and uncertainty uh, global condition. And the right side, we can look at uh, peaks broadband speeds uh, by uh, in the world. We can look how uh, technology and uh, very, uh, very important, as I mentioned before. And now we can look how, uh, where is uh, the nation, our nation? Indonesia is uh, about uh 20 i i think uh 10 uh 10 to 20 uh, mbps this are uh, very low i think uh because uh we can look in other region uh, like uh america europa uh, is uh 18 uh to from 18 to 100 uh, mbps okay uh this next i will okay uh the third one is direct taxes and transfer have a uh, limited distribution uh, impacts in developed uh, asia as i mentioned before how uh, respond to fiscal policy and uh, monetary policy uh, to uh, respond this COVID. Uh, now we can look how uh, indonesia is a uh, Disposable income and engineer uh, co coefficient is uh, higher than uh, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, China, and Mongolia. And mar market in income Gini coefficient is uh, lower than uh, Mongolia and uh, higher uh, compared to uh, China. Okay. And next, uh, policy can make more effective uh, address inequality and example from uh, I took from uh, experience from Indonesia of course uh, this is uh, how that uh, to uh, describe fiscal policy and uh, social assistance as share uh, of income this data uh, before COVID uh, of course and we can look how uh, from 20 20 uh, sorry 20 uh, 12 20 and 12 and to 20 and uh, 17 uh, we can look every year is uh, increase okay your your time is uh, 5 minutes remaining okay sir, okay line. sir okay sir okay uh, okay uh, the big question for me and for us uh, can Asia lead the way uh, for what uh, I think uh, this uh, opportunity and uh, uh, for uh, Asia how to lead uh, for uh, the economy in the world. Now uh, I can I can give uh, to you perspective from Indonesia how uh, it can be uh, to be leader in the world. Okay, let's see uh, the picture now data. Uh, 
according to the table we can uh, look how uh, australia new zealand uh, in post uh, economies and now we can look uh, indonesia i uh, in 20 and 20 sorry uh, in 20 and 22 we uh, uh, gdp our gdp is uh, 5.3% uh, 5 and uh, projection for 20 and 23 is still uh, positive uh, five for five percent but uh, if we compare 2023 to 2022 uh, is uh, decreasing about uh, 1.3 percent okay next GDP growth in developing Asia will continue to uh, be strong in inflation uh, will rise uh, of course GDP growth in Paris along with a pace or recovery across uh, the region. Now we can look at uh, how GDP growth rate with a uh, percent and selected economies as, as we mentioned before. Uh, East Asia, is, uh, GDP growth is 4.7% uh, and we we can look how uh, the, the higher GDP growth is uh, People Republic of China up to uh, Five percent, and Indonesia, Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, twenty uh, twenty two is a six percent, and twenty twenty three is a uh, Malaysia, five point four percent, and uh, sorry, uh, and Indonesia, uh, five point two. So uh, Malaysia uh, higher than uh, Indonesia. Okay, next. Okay, uh, Indonesia uh, perspective from. Uh, uh my uh, reflection this data how uh, economy and now uh, qual2 is uh, 5.4 uh, we can look uh, based on that from a uh, central bank or kementerian uh, keuangan uh, minister of uh, finance now household as uh, any 1 2 3 4 5 uh, five uh, basic from a uh, how to recover it to, uh, to continue to strengthen. The first one is household uh, consumption. Of course, increase uh, rapidly during uh, the month of Ramadan and El uh, uh, Idul Adha, reflect in the high growth in uh, consumption and transportation and communication, as well as uh, restaurants and hotels too. Okay, the second, uh, the second one is government consumption. Uh, we know how uh, contracted in line with the decline in spending and handling the pandemic, uh, medical devices, medicines, and uh, patient care. The third one is investment. Uh, we know agree positively in line with uh, the well-maintained, uh, sustainable of the expansion of the business uh, world. And the fourth one is export. Export recorded high uh, growth in line with uh, the demand for superior national commodities and uh, manufacturing manufacture uh, products and the uh, uh, the last is from the production side uh, high commodity prices have uh, catalyzed strong uh, growth in the mining and agriculture sector uh, the expansion of manufacturing and trade sector continue to be stable in line with improvements in production capacity and domestic demand we can look how uh, from uh, 2022 to 2020 uh, sorry 20 and 20 for uh, 220 and 22 uh household consumption government consumption investment consumption uh export uh, from production such is uh, still uh, positive and this uh uh optimist uh one minute remaining okay okay the the, the last slide uh, Indonesia among countries with a uh, fastest pace uh, of recovery if we compare to other countries uh, Indonesia, uh, as I block here, is uh, we we will grow uh, and rise for uh, from five percent to uh, five for uh, five point four percent, and we can look uh, other countries. Uh, uh, any Saudi Arabia is uh, the higher uh, all the uh, country is uh, up to 11.8%. And real GDP refers, uh, per uh, semester one uh, to semester, uh, we, if we compare to 
semester one in twenty nineteen. How Indonesia is in in twenty nineteen we can a growth GDP growth is seven point one and now to quarter two in twenty twenty two is a five point four percent. Okay. Uh, hey, the, the, the last uh, the sir, uh, pressure in Indonesia financial sector is uh, relatively moderate compared to many uh, uh, countries, as I mentioned before. We look at the uh, red bar is uh, Indonesia, how uh, in 2022 is minus 8 point, uh, sorry, sorry uh, 9.3 percent, and uh, stock index, we uh, six point x then uh yield change for uh Indonesia is uh one hundred uh twenty five basis point. Okay, Indonesia sounds uh macro fundamentals has contributing and limiting financial market pressure. So uh rupiah depreciation and increase of Indonesia uh, bonds yield are among the uh, lowest uh wealth stock index uh, performance many years. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for uh, okay. your time. Check. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. President Tosilalahi, uh, the young economist of uh, Faculty of Business to Tamatana Christian University, uh, who also the researcher in population uh, institution at Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia, Jakarta. Uh, now it's time for questions and answers from, from the participants. And I'll, uh, I want to have, uh, I, I want to give a, uh, like, welcome, yeah? Wel uh, welcome to all the participants, especially from foreign countries, uh, from Malaysia, and then from South Korea, from United States of America, from Thailand, and of course, most of us are from Indonesia. Thank you very much for your uh, participants from our uh, webinar uh, today. There's uh, three questions. There are three questions from participants who already give to me. I think the first one is the question for Professor Mei Yun Chin from Mrs. Umi Murtini. How is the impact of COVID-19 on stock market in Asia? Do you have any study on this uh, topic? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the first from the first question is from Mrs. Umi Murtini to Professor Mei Yinchin. Professor Mei Yinchin, do you have uh, any comment on this? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Punawan. Okay, yeah. uh, actually my specialization is in international trade. Okay, yes. and the stock market is more for financial economics. All right, but however, we also actually do do have uh, some uh, reading on this, but actually I do not do the research on the stock markets. But what we can see is that definitely uh, the stock market is uh, influenced also by the perception uh, of the, uh, the majority and the consensus expectation. All right, so when there is a COVID-19 pandemic, when the investors are pessimistic, all right, and definitely they would, uh, they would actually uh, uh, a bit uh, conservative in their investment. And therefore, when there is a COVID-19 pandemic hit, all right, and the stock market is definitely do not performing well. All right, similarly, whenever there is any uh, uh, bad news that happened in any country, the stock markets of the country will definitely is not performing well. But having to say, all right, the overall stock market is not performing well, but certain sectors is definitely stands up because of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially for the pharmaceutical products and the growth products and so on. So uh, for my uh, uh, opinion is that, or in my opinion, it is that 
the overall stock market might not performing well because of the COVID-19 pandemic that caused a lot of disruption, especially the supply disruption. Okay. However, it will cause certain industry to stand up, especially for the pharmaceutical industry, as well as uh, for those uh, 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 products that are producing growth, for example, and also uh, products that are actually focusing more on uh, digitalization. Okay, thank you, Prof, uh, for your answer. Uh, now is from Leiden Merrick from Indonesia for Professor Fandi Ciptono. Uh, Prof, uh, referred to our webinar topic today about recovery post pandemic. And as we know that beyond the uh, direct impact of COVID-19 infection of and death, this extraordinary crisis forced families into poverty exhibited income and wealth inequalities and disrupted international trade, stunting many national economies. The aftershock of 2021 have continued to 2022 with geopolitical tension and the conflict in Ukraine, adding to periods of pre-existing challenges and sending shock wave to global food, energy, and community markets. In your perspective, Prof. Ciptono, what strategies in 2023 will help ASEAN economies, especially developing countries, can build back better and how do they can on track? Mr. Fandi Ciptono, your oh, comment. Yeah. Yes. I think, <clears throat> thank you. I think the question is a bit more macro, right? Yes, My yes. perspective is more... Yes on business. So in, yes. in marketing, what we say is yes. we are more concerned about selective demand, not only the primary demand, right? Yes. Same. When we talk about strategy, if the question is about generic strategies for the country or the region, my, my simple answer is, refer back to my earlier description, every single strategy must be contextualized, right? Okay. The way a company is emergent in terms of the way they adapt to the situation, that will affect how they can fight with you know, like the situation. However, of course, there are factors that are relevant for all players in all industries. Some factors are only relevant for particular industries. And within the industry, the effects can be different based on different you know, like companies. So for me, it's, it's very difficult to answer the question in a definitive way because in marketing, yes. when we talk about strategy, it also depends on your position in the market. For instance, in, the mar in, in, in marketing and strategic management, if we are the market leader or if we are the challenger or if we are the imitator, then the strategies could be different. However, whatever it is, when we talk about the future, there are two, two things that we need to consider. First is innovation. And second right. is about flexibility. Innovation is all about doing things differently or doing different things. That's the basic thing. So we know that when it comes to recovery period, those who can... You know, remember, I, I, I'm more interested in long-term survival, right? It's like a marathon, not only uh, you know, like a sprint where we have to see all the indicators and in, uh, in a longer term. So businesses, depending, if we look at the businesses that can grow during this difficult time, as you see now in many countries, for instance, back to the topic that I'm doing, in New Zealand, when the government decided to open the borders, Everybody wanted to leave the country. Mm. So long for all the booking for traveling to Australia, to Fiji, to any other countries. For myself, for my family holiday planning for early 2023, you know, like a couple months ago, already being so expensive, so difficult. So those who are in that business, now the simple question is, are you able to go back in terms of flexibility because we see so many issues. We talk about airports, for instance. Many of my friends also complain about the situations now. During COVID-19, 
they downsize the businesses significantly, right? As a result of the strategies they implemented. Now they outsource so many services like baggage handling, things like this, right? Now, when the demand is suddenly increasing rapidly, it seems that many airlines are not ready to cope with new situations. At the end of the day, from an analysis or from an analyst perspective, we see that demand is low, we complain. Demand is high, we also complain. <laughs> that is business reality. So for me, I can't give a definitive answer, but it depends on you know, like different you know, like contextualized. You see the market position, your which business you are, but innovation, flexibility are the two key things here. Okay. Thank you, Thank you uh, Professor Ciptono. Uh, Professor Mu Yinchin, are you still with us? Uh, I think even this is uh, the question for for Mr. Fandi Ciptono. I think you can also answer this question because this is a little bit more, more macroeconomics that uh, Mr. Fandi Ciptono said. Uh, Professor Mu Yinchin. Uh, can you Please. repeat again? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, even though this question is uh, addresses to Mr. Uh, for Professor Fandi Ciptono, but I think you can also give a, a comment on this because this is a little bit more macroeconomics, uh, macroeconomics uh, about how the uh, uh, sorry. What strategies in 2023 will help ASEAN economies, especially developing countries, can build back better and how do they get on track? Your comment, Mr. Uh, Professor Wei Okay, I think this question is also uh, quite similar with uh, another question that I'm going to ask yes. for uh, uh, Leiden. Uh, uh, what is the name? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, the second question is a uh, second yeah. question. Yes. Uh, so, actually, uh, you, you know, uh, ASEAN is already formed many years ago. All right. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the economic integration, we actually proceed from the loose one until the more integrated one. All right, and then ASEAN today is actually uh, becoming more and more integrated. Okay, we already understand each and other's uh, strength and also weaknesses. All right, and of course, ASEAN is, uh, we are having 10 countries of ASEAN and each of the country have our different uh, uh, economic perspective and also have our different background. So it is not easy to actually uh, get together, all right, to actually have our our. our, our how to say to have one policy in order everyone can actually uh, are facing the win-win uh, situation but uh, my my opinion is that because of we already understand each and other uh, long enough therefore i think the policy makers of uh, ASEAN countries can actually sit down and have uh, various discussion in order that we can have a freer flow of factors of production. The factors of production here is not only referring to the goods and services, but also referring to the uh, labor. Okay. Even though we say we already uh, go uh, to another level of economic integration, but in terms of the practicality, we are still facing a lot of uh, uh, you know challenging. All right, to allow the. Uh, factors of production flow from one ASEAN country to another. So I think that is, uh, in order to, to, to solve the problem, it is important for us to actually allow freer flow of the factors of production. This is number one. And second, uh, it's actually the ASEAN country can actually group together to actually come up with the policies that can attract a foreign direct investment. For example, Okay, uh, when uh, there is a foreign direct, uh, a foreign investor uh, come to one of the ASEAN country to invest, all right, the goods and services that actually produce in that country to uh, export to another ASEAN country, okay, we could actually give a special, uh, a special, uh, how to say, incentive and or are given them a special tax rate, even though the tax rate now is getting lesser if you are 40% of the products are from ASEAN country. But if we, we can actually afford, uh, 
intensify this kind of uh, a benefit, we can actually, uh, uh, how to say, we can actually uh, uh, attract more uh, high value aided foreign investor to invest in ASEAN and together we can actually enjoy the benefits. And also that means in terms of uh, foreign investors and in terms of the free flow of the uh, free flow of the factors of production are the important factors to help uh, ASEAN to actually uh, go strong together. Okay. Thank you, Professor uh, Ming Ming Jin. Uh, did I answer Ming the Ming question? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Actually, uh, you also uh, answer your uh, the second question for you, right? Uh, so together, right? Uh, from uh, I think it's from I forgot his or her name. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. I think it's from lending lending Marin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mar Marin. Yeah. Uh, Martin. Okay. Thank you. And now it's. Uh, Question for Mr. Silalahi. I think it's Miss. I, I forgot to recall his presentation. Yeah, Mr. Silalahi uh, presentation. Some they give uh, some microeconomic data yeah, to show the path of recovery in Asia. Government spending decline in some countries. The emerging market now experience slowing economic growth that affects the employment. Digital technology can help economy to recovery in Asia. This is actually points that I can recall from uh, uh, Mr. Silalahi presentation. Now, Mr. Silalahi, there are two, two, two questions for you from the participants. I think it's, it's, uh, this is a very similar question. Why Indonesian growth, Indonesian GDP is still OK? Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh, this is the question from uh, just a second, uh, Mr. Yanto and Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Agung Pratama. Yeah. The question I think is this is a similar, yeah. and uh, this is almost similar. Why Indonesia condition is still better than other compared uh, the other countries? Now your comment, Mr. Silalai. Well, Pak Awan, uh, I will try to answer uh, from Yanto's question. Uh, I think it's two, two questions all together. It's okay. Almost okay. Okay. With uh, Agung Pratomo. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yes, yes. Agung uh, Pratomo. Uh, in my opinion, uh, as uh, by uh, based on that data, uh, why Indonesia is a uh, good, uh, better than other countries. As I mentioned before, uh, that uh, Indonesia growth is uh, driven by uh, demand or uh, from consumption uh, sector. I think up fifty uh, percent. Uh, correct me if uh, I wrong. And we uh, the latest uh, report from the World Bank, Indonesia Economic Progress, it uh, October twenty twenty, uh, is predict that uh, Indonesia economy will grow uh, up to. Uh, five point one percent, so it increase uh, from the uh, before, and this slide also with uh, the global economic prospect. Uh, this what uh, projection is uh, based on several supporting factor, such as uh, increased cons uh, consumer confidence again, better terms of uh, trade because we have uh, commodities uh, as uh, example uh, oil farm and uh, uh, coal. And and then uh, the G the G20s uh, forum of course uh, is represent uh, eighty percent of the world economy. So uh, we know twenty twenty five percent uh, sorry uh, seventy five uh, percent of international trade is uh, two divided three is a world uh, population. So uh, how important uh, this. This show us how important this uh, forum is determining the direction of uh, world economic policy, and what uh, benefit for uh, for Indonesia. Immediate benefits: we, uh, uh, the first is increased foreign exchange, uh, foreign exchange from delegation visit to Indonesia. So it it can impact to uh, stock markets. How uh, when uh, our exchange rates is appreciation, 
a signal uh, positive signal to uh, stock markets and then revive to hospitality uh, sector of course uh, bali uh, increase uh, up to 8.7% uh, when uh, cut uh, G20's forum. And next, support to increase uh, domestic consumption and uh, then uh, optimizing uh, the role of uh, small, uh, medium uh, enterprise and increase uh, employment absorption. And then the last for, uh, to uh, Sir Yanto, yeah? Yanto. Yanto. Yes, Yanto. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Totally agree with you as uh, as well uh, as we all know in uh, 20 and 24 there will be a presidential election and it will be turned to uh, economy uh, round again I have to say uh, the economy benefits because of uh, the most uh, domestic consumption so uh, the uh, now challenge to uh, going forward is uh, how the government adopt uh, policy and utilize uh, technology to uh, support uh, GDP. If people, uh, if people, if people worry about industrial uh, for four point zero, I'm more uh, worry uh, about the government uh, four point zero. That's uh, least. Uh, okay. But yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silalahi. Okay, uh, there is a question that has come to um, uh, Professor Fandi Ciptono. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about entrepreneurial strategies to recover from the crisis? Mr. Van de Chiptono, please. Okay, thank you. You know, entrepreneurial strategy is not something new. Actually, the, the basic idea behind that is how to find new ways to do the, thing, the same things or do different things. Now, when we look at the, the hospitality sector, for instance, some of the entrepreneurial actions they have tried before, for instance, digitalization of the services, and then how they found new ways, for instance, for the hotel restaurants, used to be one of the SBU of, or unit within the, the, the hotels. They found ways during these difficult times, how to survive, how to create, like how to make sure that the revenues are there. So they come out, some hotels like, the, the restaurants within the hotels, they come up with frozen food being delivered at home, so ready to prepare, ready to cook you know, like at home. That has not been implemented before, right? Same like my illustrations, I show hotels in Malacca, I think in Malaysia, they offered, they extended the services, being like a consultant for landscaping issues, gardening, you know, like things like that. So they try many ways to extend the services, to find new ways. And some of other sectors like restaurants, they had, they had you know, like big spaces in a, uh, in a beach in, 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 in Bali. So they offer camping there while they're serving with this food and then all the packages. Because during COVID-19, the, 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 the problem with tourism and hospitality most customers, they found that the thrills of experiencing the adventure adventure, and things like that could not 100% like be replaced by virtual tourism or other things. While when we talk about virtual tourism, that is also another entrepreneurial you know, like uh, initiative. Some museums, for instance, museums in some other countries, they have been successful in using the virtual, you know, like all the, you know, like augmented reality, things like that. Because for, for museums, without being there, you, you can use this kind of augmented reality. Some segments out there, they still enjoy the services. So in essence, there are many ways of how to look into the strategies. For us in higher education, for instance, we know that uh, dual delivery is the term used at my uni, right? We provide the service offline. Students come to the class, and then we also at the same time do the live stream via Zoom, and then it's also pre it's also recorded. So after all these things, moving forward, we know that 
all the online and also recording will stay. Now the only the only challenge is how to find the better mix to give to give you like student experience and also engagement in our learning and teaching. So these are just some of the examples of how to implement the entrepreneurial uh, strategies. The basic thing is do the same things differently or do different things. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Prof. Fandi Ciptano. Right. Uh... And the last one, I think this is my question actually to Professor Muyenchis. Uh, could you explain about uh, the re, the quality of regulation of country policy? Maybe uh, what 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 does it mean? I think that this is give more impact during COVID nineteen pandemic, Professor Chin. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, actually, uh, nowadays, uh, people talk about uh, uh, corporate governance and the corporate okay. governance uh, is uh, getting more and more important and the regulatory uh, uh, quality is also uh, people are more aware because when there are many scandals happen here and there, uh, this country and that country and so on. All right. Then people are actually... Uh, getting more aware of the importance of the corporate governance and also the regulatory quality. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the uh, international professional body, okay, in the past it's called ICSA, and now it has already changed the name, all right, which is uh, in, uh, is very focusing on the corporate governance, all right, in order to produce the corporate governance uh, officials, all right. So uh, why this is so is because of uh, uh, when there is a COVID-19 pandemic or uh, happen, all right, the economy of the countries is actually, most of the economies of the country has uh, facing uh, uh, recession problems, all right. So in order to actually uh, we, uh, return back the economy to the previous one, all right, they must have a very uh, a good governance in order that they can really understand, all right, and follow the procedures Okay, what are the important uh, procedures and what are the goods and services that are really help the economy uh, back to the uh, pre-crisis level? Okay, instead of uh, focusing other uh, self-interest benefit. And when this has become more important, okay, during the COVID-19 pandemic, so this quality of the regulatory has become a significant impact on the international trade. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Thank you. From from your explanation. Okay, uh, this is also uh, just uh, receive a question from Olivia, University of Chicago, USA. Doctor Chiptono, oh, this is from uh, for Professor Fandi Chiptono. You mentioned the strategy of downsizing that many hotels use to cope with the COVID nineteen pandemic. I have seen how COVID nineteen has also resulted in many budget cuts in university in the US and caused downsizing in faculty members and department. How applicable would you say your points are to the higher education sector? Professor Ciptono. Okay, thank you. I like this question, right? It's not only, you know, like the, the defects are not only in US everywhere, including at my institution. Now, I would like to highlight again, right? In our observation, of the strategies implemented by hotels in Malaysia and Indonesia. I mentioned that there, there are four broad strategies, right? Cost-based, product-based, market-based, and also community-based. Within the cost-based strategies, among the strategies implemented is what you mentioned about downsizing. Some people like to use the term right-sizing or whatever they use, basically they you know, like they cut the budget, right? <laughs> they reduced the number of departments or uh, uh, staff. Now I mentioned that it is it is high. We can easily expect when a firm or an institution or organization is in a difficult time or crisis. First thing comes to mind is try to cut the uh, the cost or expenditures. Now. Remember in my last slide, I show a cartoon showing that you're like, why don't we, you're like, can I, can I share that one again, please? 
Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, you still uh, as a co-host, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you can stop sharing this one first, probably. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the company. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Let Let me share my screen again. Ah, uh, this one. Okay. Remember when I when I show this one, the left hand side one, right? <clears throat> I don't understand after so many budget cuts, why don't we move faster? The challenge with downsizing, remember, I mentioned that like here is yes, my conclusion part here. Cost-based strategies focus on firm survival, should not rely only on this strategy, right? We need to find other ways to grow or you know, like to think about longer term. For short-term survival, may just to keep our business afloat. But when we go back to the basic, if we cut things, accounting people, we always say that we have value added activities and non-value added activities, right? When we want to be efficient, it should be based on a very systematic understanding and analysis before we come to the conclusion. Otherwise, we will face the challenge like this. Look at this, this is an irony, right? They maintain all the executives, but they cut down those important to help the boat to you know, like move faster. Same with universities. I know some universities during difficult time, they offered the staff, you know, like permanent staff or temporary staff, academic, non-academic, the so-called you know, like, uh, packages for them you know, like uh, to take but if you do not plan that well you may miss important stuff key stuff who may be not the target of that kind of policy and another thing go back to the basic now we see that the most important point is we need to rethink about the strategy for the first place at the first, first place if it was driven by survival, then when things are getting better, we need to reorganize and also rethink because the basic thing about higher education sector, we have teaching, research, community service and leadership, isn't it? If you cut too much on everything, at the end of the day, when, you, when it comes to teaching, you need teaching stuff, right? That is also important. I think you like, that is the thing, same phenomenon across different you know, like businesses, but the same question, how far can you go with only strategy like that? Because downsizing is not supposed to be done for long term if we want to go back to the business again. That is, that's my uh, responses. Hopefully I answered the question. <clears throat> yes, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ch uh, Chip Tono. That I think is uh, that's all the questions from the participant. Is it any that I miss the questions from the participants? I think it's that's all already. Thank you very much. I think it's we exceed the time. Yeah, uh, twenty minutes <laughs> from eleven. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Muyinchin from Malaysia. Then thank you very much for Mr. Fandi Ciptono from New Zealand. And also thank you very much for Mr. Uh, Restanto Silalahi from Indonesia for your time with us and also for all participants that's already uh, joined in this webinar. Thank you for comment, for your questions and also Thank you for the time for, for us. Uh, so uh, now time I give back to the master of ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the moderator and all the speakers. And wow, what a bunch of new things we just listened. I can see the excitement here. Wow. Before we end this webinar, let us now get relaxed a bit after all the seriousness we had.
Let's go back to the time where we were young and playful, no burden, just having fun away from the busy world. So we've prepared a mini game called Guess the Emoji. So while waiting for the screen to change, this is basically a emoji game guessing. So we will show you a set of emoji and all you have to do is just guessing the phrase or word. This is like the gibberish game, if you know. So um, for anyone who can read the emoji, you can raise your hand or type the answer in the chat box and the operator or me, the MC, will read your answer to us. All right, first try, we'll give you a demo. Yeah, uh, my partner will guess the emoji on the screen. Okay, let me guess. Uh, I think this is love and letter. So the answer is lo love letter, is it right? Yes, that's right, correct. And now you know what to do with the emoji quizzes. All clear? Let's get started. All right, operator, please show us the next emoji. Yes, so could anyone guess? We put the hand here. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Yes. Oh, there are three. Okay, okay. My partner, can you choose one? Okay, I choose Marcel. Can you answer? Axel <laughs> Manuhutu. You can unmute yourself. Okay, so uh, we had Maura Christi as the first one who answered Haunted House. So let's see if it's right. Yes, this is Haunted House. And then the next one. Uh huh. So can anyone guess this? This is the, you know, with all the hint, the GDP growth, this should be a country. So can anyone guess what country in East Africa that after real GDP growth, the country went into a recession in 2020? Jones Parlindungan, Nigeria, no. Another answer, Med, oh wait, I think I found, okay. Uh, the answer is yes, Madagascar. So, Miss Fiona, you're right. And no, that's not Angry Bird. And then the next and the last. Yes, this is an English idiom. So, could anyone guess? I think this is pretty useful in the real life. Yes. Miss Olivia, once in a blue moon. Yes, this is once in a blue moon. If I get that right, the answer? Yep, that's right. Okay, how was it? It is one, isn't it? Thank you for your enthusiasm in this game. We also thank the participant from Dianapura University and then Analas University, 17 Agustus Surabaya, and then Santi Buana Institution, and then IAIN Ponorogo, Islam Fatah State University, STI YKPN, UPU, ISB, UPR, and all participants from other institutions. Thank you for the breathtaking topics delivered by all the speakers once again and the outstanding moderator. This surely is very joyful. We believe we all got some mind-blowing things from all of them. 
And now we are here for the best asker. So can you guess who will be the best asker? Okay, without censoring, we will immediately announce. There are Mr. Leden Mering, and then Mr. Agung Pratama, and Miss Olivia. Congratulations, you will be contacted by the committee via chat box. Please kindly check your private message in the Zoom. Now, ladies and gentlemen, could you please turn on your camera for a virtual photo session? Show us the joy, show us what you feel, and don't forget to smile, okay? The operator will count and capture the slide. Okay, I will count uh, slide one. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Next slide. One, two, three. Okay, next slide. One, two, three. And last. One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now that we are at the end of this event, we truly hope you found the presentations on this webinar informative and helpful. And once again, allow us to thank the our inspiring speakers and moderator, all the spectacular participants and the committee members who made this event possible. Before we end our program today, we are informing all the participants to fill out the G form that has been put in the chat box. Please type your name correctly for the e-certificate will be sent soon after you submit the form. Now, let's pray together. Allow me to lead the prayer in Christian. Please kindly support the prayer in your beliefs. Our Father in heaven, as we come to the end of our time together, we thank you for what has been accomplished here today. May the matters discussed serve as a catalyst to move us forward and cause us to advance and see growth in all areas of our lives. May we live here recognizing you are the God of all wisdom and you are willing to lead us forward. This we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bid our farewell, allow us to thank you once again, dearest participants. You'll be remembered in our best memories. Now you may leave the Zoom room. We'll see you another day, another chance. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Pak Pandi. Bye, Koko. <laughs> thank you, Pak Jo. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ijin Lee.